welcome to the session about big data for social good using Kaggle for um, business and social impact. Um, at first, I would like to introduce the three facilitators uh, of this session to you. So, the gentleman uh, to my left is Emmanuel Lechese. Uh, he's the co-founder and director of Data Pop Alliance. Data Pop Alliance is a is an organization in, based in New York, uh, which advocates a people-centered um, big data revolution. And Emmanuel will tell you later on a little bit more about it. Uh, Emmanuel is also a passionate cartoonist, uh, and you will see and hopefully enjoy some of his big data cartoons. Um, during the session. The other gentleman, um, to my far left, is uh, Peter Pettenhofer. Uh, Peter is a, a data scientist with the machine learning startup DataRobot, which is uh, based in Boston. So Peter is uh, also in his free time all into data science competitions. Uh, and he especially loves these data science competitions if they are uh, for social good, if that's a relevant uh, problem that he's solving. And he's um, pretty good at it, so the best position he reached was number 14 out of 200,000 uh, regi registered users on Kaggle. So um, he's definitely uh, a good bet if you want to learn about uh, Kaggle. And um, myself, uh, I'm Tobias Pfaff. Um, I'm the founder of Datalook. Datalook is um, a young startup. It's uh, seven months old. And we are promoting uh, that people replicate data-driven projects um, for social good. Um, and yeah, and I forgot to, to mention that um, Peter uh, uh, also writes the nuts and bolts of um, machine learning algorithms like gradient-boosted regression trees. So um, if you're having questions, detailed questions about these algorithms, um, Peter is also the one to ask. And if he's not doing that, you can find him in backcountry skiing and the Austrian Alps. Um, I would also love to backcountry ski or draw cartoons, but I have a 14-day-old daughter at home, so after the talk I better get right home and uh, change the diapers instead. Sure. Um, so why are the three of us standing here and um, presenting this, this talk today? The reason is that um, our three organizations are aiming at um, creating and running such um, data science competitions uh, with a social good use case, and we are currently working on that, and Emmanuel will uh, mention this in a bit. So in order to um, familiarize you with the agenda for this um, roughly one hour session, um, we'll start with a short introduction to the topic of big data for social good. Emmanuel will talk about the macro perspective and I will then take over and tell you a little bit about the micro perspective regarding this topic. And after that, Peter will take over and give you a short introduction um, to Kaggle, the largest data science competition platform in the world. And after that, we'll uh, we have planned we have planned to do an interactive crash course together with you. Um, if you want to participate in this interactive crash course, you're welcome to um, open this link, um, the, the short link which is there, and you will find a, a document where you see some um, code in the program language of Python. Uh, and there is a, a, um, a green button actually in the. Um, let me quickly open this. Okay, that's what you're going to see, and um, you can statically see this. Oh, sorry. <coughs> yes, thanks. That's the page you're seeing if you're entering this uh, short link. And if you want to um, statically see this um, document, just scroll down. If you want to manipulate it, if you want to play around with it, just click on the green button, and then you're asked to create a user account with uh, Vakari IO, and um, then you can. Um, do it, the same stuff that we're doing. Uh, and also you can um, do a create a user account with Kaggle so that later on um, if you want you can uh, submit your first um, entry to, to Kaggle. So that's the, the agenda and I'll now hand over to, to Imam. Thank you. Um, Alright, so I'm putting my little timer. Um, Okay, so yes, I'm going to give you an overview uh, of big data and development, so which is a topic that I started being interested in about three, four years ago. Uh, I worked for the UN, um, and I wrote a paper on big data and development in 2011 for UN Global Pulse, and the title was Big Data and Well for Development. Um, 
<clears throat> All right, so yeah, so Thomas mentioned that I'm also a cartoonist. So this cartoon essentially uh, captures, conveys the, the fact that we've entered this new era of big data, which has been this, this sort of buzzword for the past couple of years. And it's a bit of a wave, it's a bit of a shock. Um, and uh, for the most part, we still don't really know what to do about it. I mean, it's like a, sh a shock of clash of cultures. Um, so you see this like, older gentleman uh, well, thinking that it's, it's actually hard to make sense of it. Um, and so much of the appeal of big data has been centered on its uh, potential to um, so like eradicate poverty. I mean that was like the sort of like biggest uh, sense like promise or expectations around, around big data. And we've heard this, this notion that data um, is the new oil that was that had to be refined and, and from which like social value could be, could be extracted. So this analogy, so I've saw this cartoon in a sense captures the like both sides of big data, so the so the sort of positive potential of big data, but also its negative uh, potential. Uh, so of course this cartoon relates to the, uh, the sort of resource curse um, that has affected many resource-rich countries um, when when it comes to big data being being the the, the new oil. Now, so this is a graph, um, so a picture that I show pretty much in all of my talks, you may have probably heard of big data being being presented or described, or at, if not defined, but at least described according to the three V's of, of big data. Uh, well, if, if yes or if not, it will just, like, just reiterate what the three V's are supposed to stand for. So they stand for volume, so big data, big data sets, lots of data. Um, velocity, so a lot of these data are high frequency data, so they are produced um, like every second as we interact with digital devices and services. So it can be your cell phone records, it can be your credit card transactions, uh, blog posts, web-based data. Um, it also includes like high frequency satellite images, weather data. And the third V was variety. So they come from different sources, structured, unstructured. Structured mean, means that it can be put in, in just Excel sheets or matrices. Unstructured would be a video file. Um, you would have to like, turn it into a structured data set to actually analyze it, um, at least to, to conduct statistical analysis. So, so I prefer to use this news, like this other lens, which is sort of three C, or the three C's of big data. So the first C stands for crumbs. So it's essentially what I've just mentioned. It's, it's big data as the data, but they are very there are very specific type of data, so I stress the fact that it's not so much a quantitative shift, it's a qualitative shift, meaning that these, the, the bulk of big data as data are people's data. They're, they're, they're produced, emitted as, as breadcrumbs would be, like we leave these digital traces as we move around, like we do that passively, uh, not for the purpose and the intent of analysis as opposed to a survey, survey data which you know you're being surveyed in and you say yes, etc. So that's crumbs. The second C is capacity, so it's machine learning algorithms. So it's really the blending of tools and methods from the social sciences and the computer science, plus bigger computers, parallel computing. Uh, so that that's that's the, the what, that's what falls under capacities. And the third one is community. What I mean by community is to bring a human element in big data. Community can be people emitting the data, people using the data and people analyzing the data and then the sort of feedback insights that are created from, from the data coming back to, to, to people, communities, governance. Um, and, I, and I sort of frame big data as this ecosystem. Now when people ask, okay, what can big data be used for? What are its, its potential applications? And I, again, I mean big data as an ecosystem, not just as data sets and data streams. So the first one, so this is a taxonomy that I've developed with uh, other co-authors. Um, so the first one is descriptive. It's just, you do heat maps, word clouds, you just describe like human reality in real time through visualizations or other means. Um, and you just show some aspect of reality through, so through, as it, as it appears through big data. The second is, which we're focusing on is pre today, is, is predictive in two senses of the term. The first is forecasting. So it is to say, if this is happening now, the likelihood that this is going to happen the next second or tomorrow 
is such. So it's the realm of I mean, whether this is what yeah, climatologists do. Uh, predict, predictive policing is also something that falls in the realm of prediction. Uh, if you have these covariates, then the likelihood that there, will, there is going to be a crime in that area is, is such. And actually, some police forces in the US and the UK use that. The second sense of predictive or predicting is inference. It is about predicting um, what is happening now or what is the level of some variable now on the basis of a, another set of variables. An example that I, that I go over in uh, 10 seconds is if you have cell phone activity, what does it tell you about poverty levels in, in a region? Can it tell you something? So you infer from cell phone activity the level of poverty or population density in an area. Okay, so that's the second kind of prediction. And then there is prescriptive, which is the realm of causal inference, it is if I change something, dealt, like uh, uh, if I invest more in education, this is the result, and this is going to be a causal relationship. And whether and how, the question is whether and how you can actually use big data to actually make such causal inferences, and the answer is that it's pretty hard. Now, so this is a, a cartoon that I did um, to, um, so to illustrate how big data works. So, and so this is exactly the example that I, just, that I just gave you about, you have cell phone activity, and you try to predict, i.e. infer, um, socioeconomic level. So there are four panels. So the first one is, is that just sets the stage. Basically you need two data sets. Okay, so just bear with me. So you have a sur you have survey data telling you the actual poverty levels in different areas of, of a city. And you you have then you record, you look at um, cell phone activity. So just the way people behave with their cell phones, how many times they call, how far they call, what time do they call, etc. And you create variables out of those out of those data points. So it's not about what people say, it's just about the sort of digital signatures that that these different communities uh, display. So all these data points, these, these they're called call detail records, they are recorded by telecom operators in their data centers. And essentially the, the bottom line is that like poor poor areas and poor people, if you take like a binary approach, use their cell phones very differently from, from, from rich people. So, and this is the last slide, so at the end of the day what you're trying to do is build a model that sort of helps you translate, find the best correlations, the best model between how a rich area, how people living in a rich, rich area behave with their cell phones and and the, the, the level of that, that area. Here's the post -post question. Um, can we have a Q and A in the, in the in the middle of the session? The post -post? And so the application here, for instance, is that if you are in a country that hasn't had a census in in, in in 30 years, which is the case in some in some African countries, for instance, not just in Africa, but in some African countries. So imagine you do that in, in a country that has had a census. So then you have your model. And you apply the same model to the neighboring country. And you say, let's assume that the model has external validity, works the same way, and we'll try and get a sense of population density or count in that other country. Or you can also follow trends over time. Surveys are very expensive to make. Assume you have a really good model um, of, of like socioeconomic statuses in Frankfurt, you could, you could do that in real time. In real time, you could see whether there seems to be shifts in the sort of socioeconomic mesh of different neighborhoods. Now, this paper is about, um, is about uh, like prediction that we've been working on of crime in London using, using cell phone data. But it's the same, it's the same like, essentially the same mechanism. Um, you look at real, real, like real data, ground truth data, and you try to predict um, your target variable, which is, which is crime, and this is what uh, we're going to be talking about. So there are other applications, and I'm almost done. Um, so poverty and welfare, just mentioned that. In the realm of public health, there was a pretty um, influential paper about malaria spread, where researchers at Harvard looked at um, well, mobility patterns using cell phone data because they could see how people were moving and overlay, correlate that with, with a malaria spread 
to actually study how malaria was, was, um, was, was spreading. And then, last few, few slides. In terms of the implications, of course, there are huge ethical implications, and ethical is, is like means everything and nothing, because it, it's like saying there are political implications. So, so the question is really what, what we are, or we mean by that. What would be an ethical use of big data? In the case of Ebola, for instance, what is ethical? Is it to use cell phone data, even if people have not consented on, on their big data being used because it's going to save lives? Or what is or is what is ethical not to use the data, and that's well, that's an ethical question. It's a hard question, um, and and um, and in terms of power, I mean, I think that there is there is a lot of, of emphasis on the technology and the use of data to solve problems, but I think there are very deep uh, deep political societal implications with big data, and I think it can be a very empowering and a very disempowering um, phenomenon, and and but in a sense, it's it's for us to craft the future of that space. And I'll end on this one, so as, as, as data pop clients here, we are co-organizing a data festival in Cartagena in Colombia in April, uh, and we're working on uh, organizing a CAIO competition uh, in partnership with Data Robot, uh, Data Look, and the National Statistical Office of Colombia, DANE, um, here on crime prediction. So I was a bit over um, my allocated time, but I hope it was okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'll uh, take over and um, introduce you to the micro perspective of um, big data for social good. Um, while Emmanuel is basically interested in big data and development, um, we, Data Look, are mostly uh, interested in bringing the superpowers of data science to nonprofit organizations and to the local administration. Let me give you one use case, uh, one, one, I think, really great example. This example is about saving lives with uh, predictive analytics in New York City. Uh, New York City has the problem that um, there are a lot of buildings that are at high risk of fire. Actually, the New York City administration gets 200,000 complaints every year about buildings um, with high fire risk. And they only have 200 uh, inspectors to go after um, these, these complaints and see if there's really a severe um, threat. So how would you organize um, this process? I mean, sending out these inspectors randomly does not make sense. What you want is you want to address the buildings that are uh, where the fire risk is the highest. Now, what uh, the New York City administration did is they um, started a small team of um, data analysts. It's called the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Um, and they came up with a model that predicts the probability that uh, um, a building catches fire. And then the, um, these 200,000 complaints were ranked according to this uh, probability, and then the, data, uh, the, sorry, the inspectors um, can be sent out much more efficiently to, to the inspections. <coughs> that was the, the situation before and the situation after introducing this, this analysis. Before the analysis, the first 25% of inspections yielded 20 one percent of severe violations, so um, violation again, a building that is at high risk of fire. After the analysis, um, that could be drastically really, uh, increased. Um, the first 25 percent of inspections yielded 71 percent of severe violations. At the end of the day, this meant that the time people, New Yorkers, are spending in buildings at risk of severe fire could be significantly reduced. Now, if you're asking, how did they do it? I mean, did they have a, a huge Hadoop cluster, or um, did they have a team of 20 data scientists from there? No. They started out um, very simply with Excel and basic correlations, and a team of two people, one lawyer and one young graduate, one young bachelor's graduate in, in economics. Um, that's when they started the analysis. Um, now they're a bit bigger, the team in New York City is a bit bigger, and they're have running more sophisticated models, but uh, my message is that um, these social good applications uh, can actually be reached with um, pretty simple um, input. Um, it's about a very innovative uh, and intelligent approach. That was just one example. What other problems, what other social problems can be solved with uh, data, or big data? Um, I posed my, uh, this question myself um, maybe a year ago. 
and, and that was the reason actually um, for founding Datalog. Datalog is uh, basically a platform for crowdsourcing data-driven projects for social good, and for discussing these projects. Um, on our um, platform, we are right now having about 240 projects, and um, you see all kinds of applications. Um, you see data-driven projects where um, healthcare, the healthcare system is improved. Um, you see data-driven projects for poor people, for homeless people, for the environment, for disasters, um, even for animal shelters. So it, it's just about um, intelligently thinking about how to use existing data to solve an existing problem. And our mission is to inspire data scientists and developers to do that and to replicate the projects that they're seeing on our website in their own community. Who are the other players uh, in this field? The other organizations that are trying to promote data science for um, nonprofit organizations and uh, uh, local administration. Um, you see some, some names here. That's DataKind, based in New York City. Base Impact, a startup in San Francisco. The Data Science for Social Good Fellowship at the University of Chicago. And there are um, a number of meetup groups around the world who specifically deal with uh, data science for social good. Mm. However, um, Germany is um, pretty much a, a white spot uh, on the map internationally. Um, DataKind is, uh, does have some chapters in Europe, in, specifically in Ireland and in the UK, um, but so far in Germany um, not many people and no organization I'm aware of is, uh, is dealing with the, the issue of, of data for social good. And we want to change that. So. Um, if you're thinking, how can I get involved in this personally, you can either go to Datalook and um, look if there are projects that inspire you, that you want to replicate, um, that you want to push forward. And the other question that could come up is, how can my company that I'm working for get involved in this, in this topic? And I think DataKind does a great job in, in the US um, in partnering with uh, larger IT organizations. Um, so for example, they're running um, corporate social responsibility programs with Pivotal or Cloudera or Teradata, where these um, corporates are sending out their data scientists for a specific time period to a nonprofit, and the, the, the corporate uh, data scientist helps the nonprofit, kind of a volunteer data scientist for a specific time, uh, and then, yeah, hopefully uh, achieves a, a great um, outcome. And that's one example where Pivotal sent out this uh, lady data scientist to uh, a New York nonprofit called Crisis Text Line. She spent a couple of months there um, and supported Crisis Text Line, and that was a, a blog post that came out. So um, if you're working for a company here in Germany who could be interested in such corporate social responsibility programs, please get in touch with me. Uh, we really want to um, establish um, similar things here in Germany. And um, now I'll hand over to Peter. Okay. Sure. Should we do questions? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Oh, that's my question. Uh, I'm curious for, for, for you. Uh, you were mentioning uh, a poor region, and then you were talking about people with cellular phones. Uh, is that really true that poor people have cellular phones? Um, well, I mean, it's, there's a there's a metric that that is the penetration rate. Uh, so that tells you how many phones there are over, like per person. Um, but some people have five phones, so the metric can be misleading. Uh, in most of um, Southern Africa, penetration rates can be between 70 and 120 um, percent. So, but again, you know, it doesn't really tell you how many people actually have at least one phone, for instance. Uh, but I mean, in general, the uh, like cell phone technology, I mean, cell phones that are like the, the use of cell phones is, is widespread in, in all developing regions. There are only uh, really quite a few very, very poor uh, areas where, where cell phones are not used. Um, I mean, the, the basic phenomenon is, has been referred to as leapfrogging. So they basically, the, these, these countries went directly from having like, no landlines to having cell phones uh, and increasingly smartphones. And, you, you may know systems or platforms like Mpesa, for instance, in, in Kenya, that is run by Safaricom, where people pay stuff using their, their these platforms, of their cell phones. Um, so the short answer is that uh, is is that yes, I mean the, the notion that 
that there is no that big data or cell phone data is, is, is irrelevant in developing countries is, is like overall uh, not, not accurate. Of course, there are differences. Um, and uh, yeah, there's more data coming from, from New York City than, than there is from, uh, from Wagalubu, but, uh, but most people in Wagalubu have a cell phone. Okay, then uh, I'll move over to the third part before we go into the interactive session. So uh, it might not be obvious how uh, data science uh, competition and social good uh, are related, but please bear with me a couple of minutes. So I tried to make the point that um, that those two are actually uh, supplement each other uh, uh, quite nicely, and uh, yeah, not only for non-profit organizations which we have before, but also for for-profit organizations such as uh, data robot. So, right, um, analyzing data and building predictive models, building predictive models is a resource uh, intensive task. And the task is shown by the cost-effective way uh, to uh, solve certain predictive analytics tasks is by crowdsourcing um, uh, yeah, in, in the context of a sort of game-like competition. And I think the most popular data science competition that uh, probably a lot of people here heard about was uh, the Net Netflix Prize. It was uh, uh, started by the movie ranking company Netflix uh, in, I think, 2007 or 2009. And they basically um, uh, handed out a $1 million uh, cash prize for, the, uh, for whoever team that is able to beat uh, their um, uh, their existing movie uh, recommendation system by at least 10%. And uh, the second thing was that uh, after uh, about two years and probably hundreds of research papers and hundreds of thousands of uh, man hours, uh, eventually one team uh, was able to uh, uh, beat uh, this kind of benchmark that, that Netflix set. Uh, but the real winner of this competition was indeed Netflix. They had a huge, a tremendous PR uh, all around the world, even in like, Austrian public media, uh, they were covered. Uh, and this the implication that it has on you know talent acquisition, etc., uh, was, was tremendous. Uh, I think of all these of all these points, uh, innovation uh, was the least uh, concerned and, and new, uh, uh, finding new ways to, to solve their problems. Okay. So uh, around that time, uh, a company uh, started and basically built a business model around this idea of data science competitions. And the company is called Kaggle. Um, it basically um, has, uh, after I think more than, than, than yeah, seven, eight years now, um, kind of built a community of, uh, they claim at least 200,000 data scientists. Uh, that participate in data science competitions on that platform. Uh, it's probably a bit of an overestimation, but it's definitely the biggest data science community out there. And so if you are interested in uh, talent acquisition in this area, then this is really your, your prime uh, hunting ground. And so what I would like you to, uh, what I would like to do now is basically give you a quick introduction to how these data science uh, competitions work and the dynamics kind of behind that. And uh, in order to do that, I probably need to do like a short uh, uh, 101 on predictive analytics. So I usually describe predictive analytics uh, by analogy of uh, automated, uh, automatic programming or function approximation. So basically, uh, what you want to do is automatically program a function that maps from some inputs to some output uh, by just observing examples of input-output pairs. And if the output is a real valid number, we usually call it a regression problem, right? So for example, predicting the stock price, uh, the price of the stock, uh, if the outcome is rather a discrete event, like, uh, you know, when an email is spam or not, we call it uh, classification. And so here's an example, just a very simple example, uh, uh, a regression problem where we basically try to predict the return rate of certain products. Uh, so imagine like a retail, a retail scenario, uh, using information which we uh, inputs which we usually call features such as what's the manufacturer uh, what was the price uh, what kind of product category uh, are we talking about right? so basically try to 
find function automatically program a function that maps from features to targets here. And so, um, what we usually do in these data mining competitions is uh, we kind of uh, uh, gather a lot of data, uh, ground truth data, and then we partition that into two uh, disjoint sets. Uh, one we call a training set that will be used to uh, create our predictive models. The, the other one is called the testing sets, and that's the test set, and that's basically used to uh, yeah, estimate the goodness of our predictive models. And uh, what we basically will do is we'll uh, hand our participants uh, those two sets, so the, the training data with ground truth information, uh, and for the testing data, we held the ground truth, of course, the, the labels, and we asked them to fill in uh, those labels and submit them uh, to us. Right, and so once participants start building models and sending us submissions, what we can do is basically we can rank them on a leaderboard uh, like this. This is like uh, you know, the central part of those uh, data science competition competitions. Uh, it gives participants directly feedback on how well they are doing uh, on this given task. So usually, so Kaggle allows usually users to do uh, uh, a handful of submissions per day, and uh, you know as you participate uh, in the competition, of course, others also participate, and there is a lot of dynamic going on in this leaderboard, and so you're always challenged. You're always uh, you know constantly checking how well you're doing compared to your to your peers, and so constantly motivated, uh, pushing pushing yourself forward. Right. So. Uh, go with this. So, so what's now, the, you know, from a business perspective, what's the what's the value of, of, of running those competitions? I think there are basically three types of three values that, that companies um, might uh, might put out of those data science competitions. So one of them is crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing has proven to be a very effective means uh, to solve certain problems, right? So on the one hand, uh, crowdsourcing usually uh, delivers a diverse range of solutions to a given problem and as you know if uh, solutions are diverse and they are, you know, errors are not correlated by just aggregating those solutions we get better results. So that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is also something that we know from research, right? That if we have people with a di very diverse background looking into a new, uh, looking in, into a new problem domain, they might come up with very new ways to solve that problem. And so the Netflix prize was very interesting when you know, not only mathematicians were you know doing number crunching, but also uh, psychologists actually started looking at the data, looking at rating behavior, like and discovered uh, uh, phenomena like preferential attachments. You know, as soon as movies started getting more and more popular, uh, people kind of you know adapted to that and and, 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 and you know uh, yeah, kind of uh, the more popular uh, movie you know got, you know, the more and more people uh, uh, rated it very highly. Um, yeah, so a lot of companies are actually using uh, Kaggle for exactly this. So here's one example is Allstate, a big American insurance company, using that for uh, building to build claim models, to build uh, pricing models. Also uh, Criteo, which is a big uh, uh, French retargeting for a tech company. Uh, but not only you know companies like uh, like this that basically just want to keep up their their, their research departments. <coughs> Also, actually, research institutes like NASA and and uh, CERN, even CERN, are are using um, Kaggle to, uh, you know, just be able, being able to actually have people with very diverse backgrounds working on you know, state of the, uh, working on their problems to create state of the art solution. Um, the second um, purpose uh, or yeah uh, benefit of, of of these kind of uh, uh, competitions is uh, of course recruitment. So in, in our area, especially. For a company like Adrobot, um, there is really like a, a fierce competition going on, especially in the US, about, about talent in this area. And um, screening talent is actually quite quite costly. And uh, competitions are a very objective way uh, to, to screen talents uh, and, and you know to assess their <coughs> problem sol solving skills on a variety of domains. The problem is often that companies like you know Walmart or Facebook. Uh, they cannot, you know, run competitions using their proprietary data because of data confidentiality issues. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a uh, 
often they don't come see a very, you know, very handy. Uh, so often they partner with companies like NASA or, uh, uh, yeah, recently there was also uh, one competition on um, predicting the quality of soil in Africa. Um, used, uh, but eventually the motivation behind that was actually a, a recruiting uh, motivation. And also here, one example that was from my private background, uh, Marine Explorer company that uh, was also looking for hiring data scientists, so they were uh, actually doing uh, uh, big data analytics uh, and big data storage for the maritime industry, and they partnered up with Cornell and created a use case that was extremely motivating. Uh, <coughs> the, the task was to predict the presence of certain uh, types of whales based, uh, on underwater microphone recordings uh, in uh, Cape Cod, which is in uh, uh, yeah, the Cape uh, around Boston. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a, was a very motivating uh, uh, problem. I think more than more than 500 or, uh, or 700 people participated in this competition. Uh, effectively, uh, the the goal of that was primarily uh, recruiting. Uh, yeah, the last uh, purpose that I that I uh, um, that I noted here is uh, PR, of course. So a lot of companies also use this kind of data competitions for public relations. Uh, yeah, and this is also a uh, uh, data for social good uh, comes in. Uh, right. Um, so for the rest of the session, we uh, what we prepared was an uh, interactive uh, CAGE crash course so that you can can see how these um, data mining competitions kind of work and the dynamics behind that. We uh, created basically. Um, um, a notebook, so this is kind of a, a website uh, where you can run actually code, um, and the outcome of the code is actually building a predictive model and then submitting uh, predictions to to Kenya. So I'm not sure if 